Hi, and good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this edition of Hand in Focus, Distal Radius Fractures. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Harvey Chim. I'm from the University of Florida, and I'll be, I'll be moderating tonight's webinar with Carl Eblin from MGH Harvard. So we have an exciting lineup of papers today. First uh, of all, we have our first paper will be Risk Spanning Fixation of Radial Carpal Dislocation, a Cadaveric Assessment of Ulnar Translation, and we have Drs. Ali Azad and Dr. Alidat Giyasi joining us tonight for the discussion. Next, our paper, the second paper is Radiographic Healing and Functional Outcomes of Untreated Ulnar Styloid Fractures Following Volar Plate Fixation of Distal Radius Fractures, a Prospective Analysis. And we have Dr. Asif Ilyas joining us today. And uh, we're very uh, honored today to have Dr. Jerry Huang, who is a professor of orthopedic surgery in the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle as our expert. So the format for tonight's presentation will be first a presentation of, of the synopsis of the article by uh, residents and fellows from the University of Washington with Zach Watershed and Ravi Sood who will be presenting articles. And this will be followed by author discussion, an expert discussion and an open Q&A. So we really want this to be very interactive. Uh, please mute your microphones and please ensure that the camera is off or the speakers are presenting. Cameras can be turned on for the Q&A. Please ensure that your Zoom screen name is your first and your last name so that we can identify you if needed for the Q&A. And please ask questions. As mentioned, we really want this session to be very interactive and an exciting and a learning experience for everybody. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to invite Zach to uh, start us off with his presentation for the first article. Zach, please. As Zach, as uh, you're bringing up your slides, uh, if everyone has questions, please put them in the chat uh, down below. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the Zoom format. Harvey and I will be manning the chat and we'll make sure that the questions are brought to the expert panel. Thanks a lot for attending. All righty. Uh, thanks everybody for having me. So I'll be presenting the first paper we'll be discussing, uh, which is titled Risk Spanning Fixation of Radiocarpal Dislocation, a Cadaveric Assessment of Ulnar Translation. Uh, and it was uh, done by Dr. Azad, Dr. Giasi, and their colleagues. Um, so just some background. So radiocarpal dislocations are relatively rare, high energy uh, injuries. Uh, they were not initially well described uh, until the early 2000s when uh, this study came out looking at 27 different cases of radiocarpal dislocations. These authors uh, classified them into two main groups of, of pattern. Uh, the first one being a purely ligamentous injury with a potential this small radial styloid avulsion injury, and the second group having a larger radial styloid fracture uh, that included at least one third of the uh, scaphoid facet of the distal radius. Uh, they didn't uh, postulate as to whether better treatments could be uh, assigned to each group, uh, but this was at least an initial foray into trying to describe this complex injury. Uh, then in 2014, uh, Potter from Utah and his colleagues uh, published a case report looking at one mechanism for, for treating this injury, which was with a dorsal spanning plate. Uh, previous injury uh, treatment strategies had relied on things like closed reduction, percutaneous fixation, and external fixation, all of which had their downfalls, uh, most notably with external fixation, pin site infections, and difficulties with the external fixator, and then with uh, less stable constructs, loss of fixation. Uh, regardless of what had been used in the past, uh, authors had noted that there was a propensity for either early or late ulnar translation of the carpus against the distal radius. And so one point of interest would be uh, the ability for a dorsal plate to prevent this relatively common complication. Um, there's two main mechanisms uh, for, for using this dorsal plate similar to complex distal radius fractures. It can be affixed to either the second metacarpal shaft or to the third metacarpal. And uh, in the paper we'll be describing, uh, our authors were interested in whether one had a higher propensity to contribute to uh, older translation of the carpus on the distal radius. And so they chose to use a cadaveric model to study this. Uh, they used 10 paired wrists uh, 
and uh, performed a type one type of injury iatrogenically, meaning they uh, lacerated all of the dorsal and polar radiocarpal ligaments uh, in order to create a significantly uh, unstable carpus on the distal radius. Uh, prior to uh, this modification, they uh, achieved uh, some standard radiographic views and then uh, looked at these same views both after injury and after fixation. And they used four different measures of ulnar translation to try to determine uh, what the frequency was. Uh, just sort of jumping to the findings, most notably, I think, is that when the dorsal plate was affixed to the second metacarpal, uh, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the wrists examined uh, had some degree of ulnar translation, depending on which met uh, method for measuring this was used. Uh, relative to the third metacarpal fixation, in which only a single wrist using a single mechanism for measuring demonstrated uh, uh, ulnar translation, um, another finding that they noted uh, just sort of that was interesting is the propensity to uh, have a degree of extension across the wrist with either the second or the third uh, metacarpal being used as a point of fixation. The, the, the authors postulated that this may be due to the uh, plate abutting against either the Lister's tubercle or the dorsal flare of the distal radius and uh, suggested that potentially using a ronger to remove Lister's tubercle could address any sort of extension there as any increased extension could potentially increase the distance of either the frayed ends or the avulsed ends of the volar radiocarpal ligaments, which are in the process of trying to heal after this type of injury. Um, again, we'll keep this pretty brief, but uh, just some brief conclusions. Uh, the authors found that there was a statistically significant increase in the ulnar deviation seen in this model when a bridge plate was affixed to the second metacarpal as opposed to the third metacarpal. Um, and Though this was a pretty consistent finding, uh, they did note the importance of uh, restoration of alignment on a case-by-case -case basis and found that um, you know, there, there was variability in this and even affixed to the third metacarpal, there was at least one patient who uh, theoret theoretically would have demonstrated a degree of ulnar translation. Um, and finally, they noted that there's limited understanding of how mechanical findings in a, a cadaveric model will translate into long-term clinical outcomes and so recommended uh, further investigation. Great, um, that was great. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, I'd like to invite Drs. Giasi and Azad to give us some comments about their paper. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just, um, I'll start and then maybe uh, Ali can uh, chime in. So, you know, uh, the impetus for this study was really um, us treating a lot of high energy injuries. Uh, with wrist dislocations and um, using spanning plates for it. And what I realized, at least in the early parts of this, is that um, it's just not getting the carpus reduced. And I think after revising a few of them, we got the idea of why don't we really sit down and study this. In addition to that, the other thing that we found out is that spanning bridge plates for wrist dislocations is potentially an off-label use, meaning that it's not necessarily uh, approved for this uh, condition. So, you know, having struggled in the OR more than once trying to figure out where the best place to put the carpus relative to the radius is, um, and then having Ali Azad back then on the service, uh, we looked at each other and thought it may be a good impetus for a study. And um, that's when um, Ali went to the lab and did a bunch of dissections to figure out what's the best uh, position to, to transfix the radius using a spanning plate. Having said that, I maybe a, Ali can comment on his experience in the cadaver lab. And, you know, I, I spent, I did a few with him, but he probably did the majority of them in the lab. Um, so maybe Ali, you can comment on what the challenges were. A, maybe in setting up the model, and we struggled in that a little bit. And then B, um, why do you think this, why do you think this, this happened so consistently uh, um, when we're trying to treat the uh, risk dislocations? Sure, sure. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you again for choosing this paper. That was a uh, great presentation, very thorough. I think you hit all of our, uh, you know, all of the points that we wanted to make. Uh, as Dr. Giassi said, where I, where I completed my residency, surplus of trauma. Uh, so we became very comfortable with using these bridge plates. Uh, uh, and that was really the impetus. Uh, we're using these plates. You know, you have the second or third metacarpal to, to, to plate to. Uh, we need to understand the, the pros and cons of each metacarpal in each, um, in each injury pattern. Um, uh, you know, these, as, as, as everybody knows, these gain great popularity in common to distal radius fractures and kind of have 
uh, uh, continued to, to snowball from there. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, setting up the lab, the major, the major difficulty, I will say, was number one, let's create a model that uh, uh, can, you know, potentially mimic something that actually happens. Now, that's, that's going to be nearly impossible because, you know, we, we essentially cut the extrinsic ligaments without violating any of the intrinsic ligaments. So we didn't have any intercarpal instability that we were trying to deal with. Uh, and then number two is plate placement. When we're, when we're comparing mil millimeters or fractions of millimeters, uh, you know, slight variations from slice, side to side plate placement uh, can affect our end result. We did our best in trying to recreate that, uh, but undoubtedly uh, uh, that's, a, that's a major limitation and, and, and something we tried to control for, but uh, you know, there, there are imperfections there. Um, and then, uh, um, lastly, I just want to say the, with, with using bridge plates, you know, it's not an old technology. And I think with something like this, as it evolves, we all have to continue to evolve. You know, the bridge plate, it's not a, it's not a new concept. It's been used for, uh, it's, a, it's a type of function that we use for plates. And it's, it's really, when you span the wrist, you're just adding ligament attacks to that. So, uh, you know, I encourage all the residents to understand why they're using what they're, do, what they're using. Um, and understanding the capabilities of each plate. And as these bridge plates evolve with different iterations, you know, you have to, you have to realize maybe this, this paper doesn't apply to every bridge plate that's out there. Um, and you have to understand why. So just having a really, really thorough understanding of what you're using is important. But thank you again for reviewing this paper. You did a fantastic job. Uh, I look forward to the, to the may, discussion. May I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. So, so Ali, so based on your findings, and I commend you on the study, it's hard to do these things in the lab. And I'll just put out there that in my own practice, uh, radiocarpal dislocations are, are uncommon, but enough at, at, a, at high volume, high acuity centers that you definitely see them often missed by others, picked up by us either acutely or subacutely. I'm a big fan of bridge plating these two. And we can talk about the indications, but I think it's a, a good corollary to jump off about whether or not to even use this technique. But I found most interesting is about the index versus middle metacarpal plate placement. And the logic has been, at least in the distal radius world, in if you're using this bridge plate and if you have a patient who's going to weight bear, say, on a walker or what have you, someone would be what we call a functional quadruped, that they have maybe a lower extremity injury plus a wrist fracture, fix their wrists with the bridge plate so they can weight bear. The logic is place it on the index metacarpal, you owner, you owner deviate a little bit, which gives you a little bit more mechanical advantage for weight bearing. And that logic may not hold true here. And I think your study bore that out that probably keeping everything more neutral with going in the middle metacarpal uh, probably makes more sense and lessens the risk of shifting the corpus iatrogenically or, or um, ulnarly. Is that, is, am I understanding your findings correctly? Is that a good way to interpret it? Yeah, sure, so, yeah. Um, Good, Dr. Yes. so uh, what happens with the index metacarpal is actually, you know, rotates the carpus as well. So it's not just a translation, it's a rotational component. As far as weight bearing goes, I mean, all my patients use elbow weight bearing when they have a wrist injury. So I tell them to push off with that. Functionally, I don't have a good functional study of patients with bridge plates, what activities they can or cannot do. But in talking to my patients, for the most part, you know, like care on their face is very difficult because they can't really get that, you know, position. But otherwise, I mean, for even for wrist fractures, I put it in my 80 some year olds and I don't splint or anything. I just say, come back in five weeks before we take it out. So overall, I, I think that it still needs to be figured out. As you know, the bridge plate technology came out of the trauma centers for high energy injuries and patients who couldn't have immediate internal fixation and it's kind of spun out into <clears throat> other indications as well. So um, stability wise, uh, we have a study that shows that the third metacarpal is probably more, more uh, stable in, in loading, uh, especially in extension um, and also technique wise. So if you're going in the wrist joint, then going to the third metacarpal winds up being a little bit easier and also for removal. So if you violate the wrist capsule, you can't just you know, take out the screws and slide out the bridge plate. You have to open up the entire scar envelope, you know, remove any scars from holes that are, you know, from the holes and then remove the bridge plate as well. So um, there's a lot of improvements to be made in this, uh, in this, in this current technology.
Uh, can I just, I'll make one last comment and I'll, and I'll be quiet. One, one of the, because we're talking about this, one of the issues I've come across with bridge plating, uh, and again, I, I'm a fan and, I, and I, I'm with you, Ali, we're still learning the best scenarios and do's and don'ts and we have limited data clinically. Most of the clinical papers are actually pretty positive on it, but still I think limited relative to our data with say other, other fixations about the wrist. But I will say that uh, with my own anecdotal experience, so we've published a case report on this as well, that and, you, and, the, and the presenter did show a picture of these implants and not to get in any proprietary stuff at all. I think if you're going to weight bear or move or keep the plate for a long time, those plates with the holes in the middle, it's a, it's a point of, of failure, fatigue failure. Um, and that may not matter. You know, in ortho, we call it dynamization. So maybe it doesn't matter because um, you're going to take it out anyways. But I think that it's just something to be mindful of. We had a case where the, it, the plate broke and ruptured the EPL because uh, she presented late because she didn't, you know, it, it is what it is. But anyway, it's just something to keep in mind that if they are going to weight bear, I'm a little bit hesitant about the the, the plates with the holes in the middle. And there's many types of plates. Okay. Uh, uh, th sorry, th thank I'm you so much. Uh, uh, you know, um, well, thank you so much for the comments. These are all great points. I do want to give uh, Dr. Huang some time to present his slides, though. And then, you know, I'd love for us to go back to this discussion. We could talk about bridge plates for a long time. So I would like to invite Dr. Huang this to, so right. he can uh, give his uh, viewpoints on this. Thank you. Yeah, no, great. Uh, yeah, great discussions, uh, both Dr. Ilis and Dr. Giazza. You've done a lot of the work on this, both clinically and biomechanically. So I'm going to give an overview of bridge plating as far as kind of my experience, my thoughts, and love to kind of open up the forum again and discuss this further. But great discussion points. So I really want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Chim and also Dr. Evely for inviting me as the uh, kind of panel expert. I think certainly Dr. Giazzi and Dr. Ilias will qualify as experts on this topic as well. So thank you. So as you, everybody is familiar by now, this was introduced by um, Burke and Searn by, back in 1998 as a great internal X-fix, at least in my practice. I don't remember the last time I've done X-fix for distal radius fracture. I think anybody has a complex injury with combinations that would otherwise be an X-fix has really been largely a bridge play, at least in my practice. And also at UW Harborview Medical Center as well, but really popularized by David Roosh and also Doug Cano. And we kind of talk about the index versus the middle finger metacarpal. I think the Harborview technique popularized by Doug Cano, one of my partners, really a specialized the Pew synthesis plate that was designed for this purpose. It's a two, four plate that spans um, across the wrist joint has both holes distally in that center portion with three central holes and a proximal shaft fixation as well. And initially it was described as fixation of the middle finger metacarpal going through the extensive compartments. And then uh, more proximally with this technique, you actually slide underneath the ECRL tendon. So for those of you who are, do, are more of a third metacarpal fixation person, this is a little bit less invasive. The, the thought is you're coming underneath the, uh, the wrist extensors, not the finger extensors, so potentially less invasive. Hopefully, you don't have finger stiffness. It's a little bit less violation of the actual soft tissue. And also, by doing this, as we talked about a couple of papers, if you do a third metacarpal, you probably have to open the dorsal wrist to make sure that you don't have the extensor tendons in there. By doing it over the second, it's probably a little bit safer. So a couple of cadaveric studies have been done. And there's several authors. This one's out of uh, Rochester, New York, looking at index versus middle. The main structure at risk is the radial sensor nerve. If you look at the index metacarpal, if you go over the middle finger, this is why this is advocated by, by Doug Cano is you avoid the finger extensors, namely the EDC tendons, by sliding underneath the ECRL tendons. And a couple other studies, Dr. Giazzi, um, a study that was done a few years ago. Again, a really nice cadaveric study showing that if you are going to try and uh, percutaneously play, uh, place that um, plate underneath the second versus the fourth compartment. The fourth compartment, you do have to be careful. You can entrap the ECRL and uh, ECRB tendons, and also the EPL tendon is also at risk. So just really keep that in mind. So I think in general, if you're going to the second metacarpal, you could actually really make a limited incision distally and proximally, set that plate underneath the second compartment. If you're going to go over the fourth compartment, you probably do want to make a separate incision dorsally over the dorsal wrist, over the distal radius. As far as my indications for bridge plating, um, certainly you can apply it to any distal radius fractures, but it was really indicated for combination, really a metaphyseal combination for, at least in my practice, it's a really, really distal fracture, a radial carpal fracture dislocation as we're describing this drone club today. Also, if you do any type of fixation, whether it's volar plating or frac specific, at the end of the case, you feel like you're, 
stability is tenuous. You feel like you want something more rigid. It's a great internal um, X fix to provide better rigid fixation. Also, we talked about early transfer, a polytrauma patient that Dr. Elias has published a really nice paper on looking at patient with polytrauma injuries. Potentially, that's a way of offloading the risk for early transfer after dislocated fracture fixation. These are my classic examples of a uh, bridge play that would be a great indication for this. A lot of combination, very small articular fragments. Uh, even if you are able to piece everything together, you probably want some type of ax axial stability to offload the radial carpal joint. But I think what we're talking about today is our radial carpal fracture dislocation. You guys did a great job kind of going over the over overview by Dr. Uh, uh, Walter Shai earlier and discussion earlier. Uh, with these, I think this is your perfect indication. Before a bridge play, you're looking at X fixing it and doing type, some type of volar radial carpal ligament repair. Um, we talked about Dumonti's classic series of 27 patients looking at type one and type two. A type one, this is a purely ligamentous injury. So there's really no fragments you can fixate directly. So you're looking at spanning the radial carpal joint with the X fix or a bridge plate. A type two, you have a large radial styloid fragment that could be fixated directly. So kind of alluded to this earlier, a great review article, a little shout out to Dr. Ilias and Dr. Mugal. These are oftentimes not a simple, a fracture dislocation of radial carpal joint only. It's oftentimes it's a combination injury. You could have intercarpal ligament injury, scaphalinate LT ligament injury, and TFCC injury as well. We're not talking about just dorsal and volar translation. Oftentimes you have ulnar translocation, entire carpal complex as well. So as far as what's involved, uh, classically it's the RSC ligaments. The so volar RSC ligaments are involved volarly. And dorsal, we talk about radial tricuitral ligaments. So be interested to hear from the other panelists as far as if you do treat these, do you do a repair of the volar ligaments and also dorsal ligaments as well? Is it enough just to provide stability across the joint or do you need to do some type of ligament repair? This is an example of a patient that looks like a standard type two uh, Dumonti, radial carpal fracture dislocation. So we fixed the radial silo and actually fixed the scaphoid as well, but you can look interoperatively, uh, even though you have good fixation of building elements, but there's still residual dorsal radial carpal transla um, translation as well. So it's still very unstable. Example where bridge play really comes into play, really reduce that dorsal subluxation uh, better for yourself to reduce the carpus directly. Bridge play, at least in my practice, is great bailout. So not just for that primary fixation, this example of a patient with a disorated fracture fixated volarly with a uh, volar plate. Unfortunately, a patient with loss of follow up comes in four months later, the entire carpus is now falling off volarly. So there's complete loss of fixation of that looney facet. This is where bridge plate's a great bailout for reducing the radial carpal joint, also providing access stability. Another example here pickleball, fragment specific fixation volarly, dorsally, and also a radial styloid plate and patients falling off dorsally, the entire carpus is translated dorsally. Again, this is a bridge plays a great bailout as far as uh, trying to provide stability and also address radial carpal translation. So going back to the paper um, that was presented really nicely earlier by the panelists, by Dr. Azad, Dr. Giazi and company, as we look at using a bridge play, second metacarpal, there's certainly quite a bit of residual owner translation. And I think what we teach the fellows and residents is the bridge play is a great tool for stabilization. It's not always going to reduce it for you. So you can't use it as a reduction tool only. You have to still reduce the articular fragments to make sure the radial carpal ligaments are properly addressed and potentially do some type of repair as well. And this is an example of a patient with a bridge play with dorsal plating. If you look at the teardrop angle, it's still not reduced. So this is an example of you have to really critically look at your reduction whether it's radial carpal translation or your artic articular surface, make sure they're addressed surgically as well. So for mortar blast injury, this is where I think having stability and having some of the central holes are really helpful. I use it as head of a building block. I'd love to hear from Dr. Diaz and Dr. Ilias is this is where the central holes, I typically like this, the plates that don't have the central holes. That's the weak point. That's where the plate will typically bend uh, with axial loading. This example, having the central holes actually able to put screws into the capitating lunate, really build that building block from the radius to the carpus to the metacarpals more distally. I think overall, I think it's really important to recognize that these injuries, you get volar and dorsal dislocation or translation, but also recognition of owner translocation that does happen with these injuries. Concentric reduction, we know it's probably the most important, important predictor of outcome for any complex dorsal radius fractures.
And also, whether you're looking at radial carpal fracture dislocation or looking at even a complex distal radius fracture, it's important to recognize that the bridge plate is a great stabilizer, but it may not reduce. So I think we're really getting a better understanding of these. It's a tool that's a great tool, but you really make sure you understand the underlying mechanism and what fragments are involved and also the intercarpal ligaments and also the important stabilizer of the wrist as well. So with that, I'll kind of turn over back to the uh, moderators. Um, so thank you so much, Jerry. That was really outstanding. And thank you so much for your insights. Uh, we could talk about this topic for a really long time, but what I want to really hear from the panelists is two things. Uh, how would you treat a, a typical radiocarpal dislocation? And would you use a bridge plate in that scenario and how would you use it? And secondly, I'd like to hear from you guys how you would place a bridge plate for comminuted distal radius fracture. Would you put on a second or third metacarpal? Would you use a plate with holes uh, and anything else? You know, I'd love to hear from you guys about this. So I certainly have a bias with uh, being a Harbor view. I think our go-to is second metacarpal, but similar to the experiences of Dr. Giazzi and Dr. Ilias, I've had cases where you apply it to the second metacarpal and you actually sublux the entire joint. So by putting that plate on it, once you fix it proximally, the entire radial carpal alignment actually shifts quite a bit. So I think you do have to recognize it intraoperatively. So for quite a bit of you know combination that mangle extremity, I do place it to the uh, middle finger metacarpal at times. So that's kind of, I do assess it intraoperatively, but my go-to is index. Do, do you do it uh, often for radial carpal dislocations? So radial carpal fracture, I've been pretty happy with index metacarpal for those cases, but I haven't seen cases with really severe ulnar translocation, but certainly something to keep in mind based on the study by Dr. Giazzi Azad, I think in case with ulnar translocation, I would certainly consider the middle finger metacarpal. Okay, great. Um, Please go ahead, anybody else? Uh... So one of the comments, by the way, what I noticed is that the joint winds up being asymmetric when you go to the index metacarpal. If you look at the dorsal component of that ring, uh, it's narrower than the bowler component and yet a bit of extension as well. Um, I go to the index for uh, fractures and middle for dislocations. And sometimes I don't even put distal screws like that. Dorsal instability one that Dr. Huang showed, I have put the bridge plate without any metacarpal screws just as the world's largest dorsal buttress plate and look at it intraoperatively and it prevents it from dislocating. Additionally, the bridge plates, I think are very novel technology. We've used it for uh, comminuted ulna fractures. We've actually done two bridge plates, radius and ulna, and also the elbow as well. So I think it's got a lot of room for growth and expansion. It's just that technology um, is, hasn't really moved much. As far as those screw holes go, Dr. Asif is absolutely right. They're a weak spot. We've had patients that don't show up for over a year with them in, which always worries you with multiple tendon ruptures as well. So lots of room for uh, growth, I think, in this particular um, technology. The only, the, Harvey, thank you. The only thing I would add to what Ali said is, and, and I agree with everything Ali said, I'm the same. I'm indexed for fractures because uh, I think it's safer for the extensor tendons and I'm middle for dislocation because I think it's more concentric in terms of the reduction of the joint. And that's really what the radiocarpal dislocation is a true joint injury, whereas just raised fractures is a, is a bony injury. The joints are generally generally okay. And you can manipulate the joint to get a better reduction. You can only deviate, you can stress the joint at least briefly to help with your reduction through ligament attacks. The, the, what I teach my trainees is put your incision between the index and the middle metacarpals so that you can cheat and make a decision. If you go index and it's, it doesn't seem right, it's all kind of looks wrong, it's not sitting properly, it's angulated too much because it's the patient's anatomy, then you can still, you can just go to the middle metacarpal and vice versa. So I think it allows you to do it, but to answer your question, Harvey, I use index for uh, fractures generally and, and, and middle for a uh, dislocation. Great, thank you so much. And on a related question, I was wondering, how often do you guys actually use a bridge plate for radiocarpal dislocation? Do you use it for all cases or some cases, or how often do you use it? Uh, Pretty I'll much for, all of them. Yeah. yeah, my last three have done it for everyone. I don't even pretend anymore to to do to 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 not at this point. I I want the stability. I want the stiffness that you know we worry about locking any joint does. And the concentric reduction that you can lock in with the with the plate is is really great. And the other thing is when you're applying the plate, if you're using cortical screws, you can sometimes translate the corpus. Um, so it's a, they're generally locking plates. So if you're if you like your alignment, just lock the plate down like internal expect. You don't need to put cortical screws everywhere and translate the corpus. Uh, but it's just such a nice, reliable tool. And 
when stability is so important and you can just lock it and leave it and just let it scar in, it, I just think it's a great tool. Can you keep them in for three months? Sorry. Three, no, go three ahead, months. please. Yeah. Three months, Jallery, or longer? You know, for just to raise fractures, definitely not three months. Uh, six to eight, and, I, and that's a really soft number. I, I can be convinced either way. Uh, for wrist dislocation, I'm biased to go longer, and then the book answer is immobilizing for usually closer to 12. That makes sense. You know, we'll, we'll see kind of the clinical picture. If there's K-wires augmenting, other constructs augmenting, what's the right time? But longer for a dislocation. Great. Um, I have one last question before I turn it over to Carl for the next paper. I was wondering, what, what are you guys experience with, uh, do you ever have to go back to bone graft and non-union when you, you do a bridge plate for distal radius fractures, for really comminuted fractures? Um, if there's segmental loss and open injury, usually uh, you, you're going to put a spacer in, maybe even an antibiotic spacer, and then uh, go back and bone graft them. But that, that winds up being the uh, rare, rare uh, instance. Um, so for the most part, I mean, I think that the, the, they're usually over-engineered. They're too stiff. I've seen two non-unions, actually, for perfectly healthy people that had spanning plates. Um, but for the most part, I think that's that's a rare, rare instance. Yeah, so I've had the bone graft, but it's pretty rare, Harvey. Um, certainly with a really quite a bit of metaphyseal combination with bone loss, sometimes you do have to go back. Um, I typically kind of make my judgment call it three months to see how they do. But surprisingly, with quite a bit of combination, they typically do heal without bone grafting, so I haven't really had to. The same. Um, Harvey, do you want to address sorry, the, to... In the box there, uh, Kyle? Sorry. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to do. Um, we're going to move on to the next paper momentarily, yeah. but uh, Dr. Jonathan Isaacs asked a question to the panel about uh, when, how do you guys judge your distraction when using a bridge plate for ligamentum taxis? It's a good question. Yeah, I think with the XFIX literature, there's always concerns of CRPS so you over distract. Certainly with bridge plate, it's a concern. Uh, there are kind of two ways that Doug Hannell's kind of taught me. Uh, one, if you do it with the fingers completely flexed, then you, you typically can't over-distract through that area there. The other thing I could do is kind of look at the mid-carpal joint. If the mid-carpal joint's dice stays quite a bit, that's an, that's an indication you probably over-distracted. Great. And you can't over-distract with a spanning plate. I didn't think you could, but I've seen a case where the mid-carpal joint was over-distracted, so I can't. So um, just, uh, Jerry, could you explain to us, uh, for of our listeners, like how making a fist you know, helps to prevent over-distraction? Yeah, I mean, basically, if you look at, if you basically have all the finger, um, if you have all the fingers flex, it basically puts the finger extensors on tension. So it really prevents you from putting too much force on there as far as over distracting. So, and you're basically putting a lot of extrinsic uh, tension on there. So it prevents you from distracting the joint even further. Great. Kind of a nice little trick for doing that. Thank you so much. That's outstanding. I'm going to turn it over to Kyle for the next paper. Uh, great. Thanks, Harvey. Um, so I'm going to ask Dr. Ravi Sood to bring up his presentation. Um, and this article uh, by Dr. Ilias is entitled Radiographic Healing and Functional Outcomes of Untreated Ulnar Styloid Fractures Following Polar Plate Fixation of Distal Radius Fractures, a Prospective Analysis. And that is a lot of words. So go ahead, Ravi. Um, you can uh, get started. Thanks a lot for joining us. And thanks, everyone, for your attention. Great. Thanks a lot. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in and for the opportunity to present here. So for a bit of background, um, ulnar styloid fractures very commonly accompany distal radius fractures. And the ulnar styloid has an important anatomic role in the DRUJ in that the palmar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments attach to it, and specifically the deep fibers or the ligamentum subcuentum insert on the ulnar fovea near the base. So it stands to reason that ulnar styloid fraction, fractures, specifically ones at the base, can lead to DRUJ instability. And despite that, literature on this has been conflicting, and I think management of these ulnar styloid fractures varies pretty widely. So uh, this study was addressing the question of whether there is an association between ulnar styloid fractures and clinical outcomes after distal radius fractures that are treated surgically. So this was a prospective cohort study out of the Rothman Institute at Thomas Jefferson uh, that enrolled adults who were undergoing a fixation of distal radius fractures with volar locking plates over about a one-year period. They also um, were, required, were required to have at least one year of follow-up and couldn't have had a prior wrist injury or an ulnar neck or shaft fracture. The primary outcomes here were two patient-reported outcome uh, 
measures, so the quick dash score and the PRWV scores that were assessed at three and 12 months. Um, so they analyzed 134 patients with dysrhesis fractures. Um, again, these were adults, uh, mostly white females, average age of 63 years, and average follow-up was about 14 months. And in this group of 134 dysrhesis fractures, a little more than half, so 52% had associated, associated ulnar styloid fractures, which is consistent with other series. And of those, they were split pretty evenly between fractures at the tip and at the base. They also looked for osseous union at the last follow-up of the ulnar styloid fracture and saw that that was present in only about a quarter of the cases, actually. And the uh, majority of the distal radius fracture pattern was uh, complete articular. So this was their sort of primary outcome. Again, it's quick dash and PRWE scores. And I think when interpreting these, it's important to keep in mind the minimal clinically important difference. And that varies a bit depending on which paper you look at, but it's somewhere in the ballpark of 14 for both. And if you look at their results, um, both at three months and at one year, you can see there's really no evidence of any um, clinical or statistically significant difference um, between the two groups. And they also um, broke it down by whether or not there was evidence of union of the ulnar styloid at the last follow-up. And again, no statistically significant difference, perhaps a trend towards slightly you know, improved outcomes in the group with the united ulnar styloid fracture, average about seven points. But again, not statistically significant and not close to the, the minimal um, clinical, uh, clinically important difference. And then last, they looked and they broke it down by location of the ulnar styloid fracture. And again, saw really no evidence of any difference. So I think overall, this was a really nicely done and well reported prospective study. I tried to be really critical about potential limitations. One is, you know, this is an observational study, so there's always the potential for confounding. You know, could it be that there's some differences? between the two groups that are accounting for the outcomes aside from the ulnar styloid fracture, perhaps. You know, it's a relatively small study, so always a potential for type two error, but I think based on the uh, minimal clinically important differences in the estimates and standard errors that they report, I don't really think that's a big issue here. And, and finally, as the authors acknowledge, there's a relatively short follow-up. I think it would be interesting to see how these patients do over longer term, and perhaps that could be a follow-up study. Um, and just to spend a, few seconds putting this in context with some of the prior literature. So this study um, is nearly 20 years old now from Dr. Blazer and others, um, but this was a similar design, but a retrospective cohort study of 130 disarrayous fractures. And in that study of the 14 or 11% that had tear J instability, all of them had ulnar styloid fractures. And they found that specifically location fracture at the base was associated with instability. So this, of course, this was very compelling. You know, they didn't look at patient reported outcomes. Um, and there's a chance that some of these results could have been related to confounding. But this, I think, inspired a lot of follow-up studies. And um, this was a recent meta-analysis of 12 such studies that were retrospective but had a similar design to the present one. So over 2,000 patients with distal radius fractures, about half with ulnar styloid fractures. And they also looked at DASH scores and, and PRWE scores and found really a minimally statistically significant difference on average three points slightly favoring the group without an ulnar styloid fracture. And that was consistent um, across the two patient reported outcome metrics. So hard to imagine that that would be clinically meaningful. So in summary, again, I would congratulate um, Dr. Ilyas and other authors on this uh, prospective study that I think is a nice addition to the literature showing um, similar outcomes in patients with distal radius fractures with and without ulnar styloid fractures. And I think in thinking about how to translate this to practice, one thing that could be interesting to see down the road is studies looking at patients who have ulnar styloid fractures fixed versus those who don't and comparing those outcomes as, as we try to decide how to apply this clinically and manage them. But I'm looking forward to thoughts from the group. Thanks again. Great, Ravi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll next invite uh, Dr. Ilias to share his slides and thoughts about this paper. Well, you know, uh, Kyle, I'll just talk about it. I, um, Ravi did a great job, and my, his presentation is better than mine, so I'll just talk about <laughs> it. So, uh, so, 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 Ravi, thank you for that. Um, just a couple of comments. You know, when I was sitting where you were sitting, uh, you know, 15, 16 years ago, um, uh, as a fellow and as a senior resident, uh, we talked a lot about ulnar styloid fractures and what to do with them. As you reviewed the literature, you saw a lot of stuff kind of dated from that time. And we've been studying it less now because 
I think conventional wisdom and, 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 and maybe Jerry will correct me is that you, you pretty much leave it alone. Um, we're not seeing a lot of problems with it. And we, we've treated ulnar styloid fractures like a proxy for DRUJ instability. So if you've got a big you know, uh, base fracture, the DRUJ can be unstable, perhaps you should fix it. And my understanding was that really wasn't borne out, but there was some conflicting data. And you mentioned one meta-analysis, there's another one published recently as well, had similar findings. But some of the earlier data was showing that perhaps there was value in fixing it, and then there's data that conflicted with that. So I thought we thought we'd look at that. And one of the advantages that we had is that we had a good prospective database of these cases. And also we had a consistency of a treatment paradigm at our center where no one was treating ulnar styloid fractures, basically benign neglect, entirely benign neglect. And, um, and we said, well, if, that, if we've had consistent treatment, we'll, we'll include all comers of volar plate fixation of fractures consecutively um, and then see how they do. And our numbers were consistent with the literature and that half, half of the cases had non-unions, which was consistent with the literature. And of those three quarters went on to non-unions, which was also consistent with the literature. So we were happy about that. And we saw absolutely no real meaningful difference whether the, 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 there was a styloid fracture or not, or if it was present, whether it healed or not. So it just kind of reaffirmed our benign neglect approach. But again, it remains some point of controversy. I think where the real problem is, we still don't really know how to assess DRUJ instability. We just don't really know how to tell that. Um, having done this for a long time now, I, I really don't know. People say, go to the other side. I think it's a great idea. So you can get up and unscrub and go manipulate the other wrist and then come scrub again and what have you. That's fine. You can definitely do that. It's reasonable. But the wrists are sloppy, especially when they're open and you've got a volar approach and you've got the wrist open and the soft tissue is mobilized. It's hard to tell. So it's hard to know, but I don't think, my final conclusion, I don't think the ulnar styloid is, should really drive us to do much of anything. And at the end, you really have to use your clinical judgment if you feel like the DREG is truly unstable or not. I don't have an objective parameter to guide you how to when to intervene or not to based on some other criteria. Great, uh, excellent points, Asif. And you know, it's definitely something that I struggle with is how to determine uh, DRUJ stability intraoperatively. And hopefully, we can carry on that discussion after Dr. Huang's uh, presentation. So, Jerry, please uh, bring up your slides, and um, and we'll have uh, some discussion afterwards. And again, please feel free to ask questions in the chat if anyone has has anything to ask. Yeah, I know. Great study. We'll kind of talk about it further. But uh, yeah, I think it's great. Like we always talk about the teaching is always not neglect on our style unless you have DRJ instability, but it's so subjective. And how do you really assess it intraoperatively? I think just this is a maybe they say, consecutive series of benign neglect. I think it's a great study. So we'll talk about it a little bit further here. Let me share my slides here. We're glad it actually turned out to be benign neglect, not, not malignant neglect. If you, <laughs> now let's keep it benign for sure. <laughs> I think maybe uh, patients in Philly are also hardier than Seattle patients, so uh, sometimes they all did pretty well. No, I would disagree with that. <laughs> but, but go on. <laughs> um, so I think as we see patients with a disorganized fracture that's healed, they're just even on the side of wrist pain. Make sure you recognize that's not always a DRUJ. And then we kind of zoom on out on that ulnar styloid fracture that's not healed and patients would look at the x-ray and think, oh my gosh, that's why I'm having pain. I think it's really important to keep that in mind. Ulnar styloid wrist pain could be a, really a kind of a host of different conditions. Could be a actual fracture itself, could be DRG arthritis, intercarpal injuries, it could be ECU tendon, could be nerve entrapment, Guillain's canal. So really keep that in mind as you're looking at treatment and evaluation of these patients, especially in the initial post-operative period. We're all familiar with this really uh, beautiful diagram and drawn by Bill and Kleiman at the end of Hand Center. So kind of references for our fellows and uh, residents really kind of understand the complexity of the anatomy around the DRUJ. I think it's important to recognize why we could leave a ulnar styloid fracture and potentially a TFCC injury uh, and treat it non-operatively. You have quite a few extrinsic stabilizers, your ECU tendon, the tendon sheath itself, the pronated quadratus, we learn more and more of the, uh, the function and importance of the DOB, the distal oblique bundle, the IOM. This is your kind of classic example of volar plane with distal radius fracture. I think two decades ago, these are the ones that based the ulnar satellite fracture. We should probably look at fixation of some sort, either with K wires, tension band wiring. We're learning more and more now as the paper kind of discusses as well. And we really have two types of ulnar satellite fractures, the ones that involve the stylo itself, that's more your superficial TFCC fibers, and your evulsion fraction involving the ligamentous subcurrent, which are the more critical fibers 
involving the TFCC. And this is a kind of a nice little uh, radiograph demonstrating the flex sign. So in addition to your ulnar solid fractures, sometimes you can have a fleck off the ulnar fovea, so indicative of a separate injury. So kind of a double uh, injury or avulsion of the TFCC, both superficially, also deep fibers as well. So these are kind of a host of papers. Uh, Robbie did a great job doing a summary of this, but several papers out of, uh, so one out of Mass General, also Korea showing now with radius fractures, really doesn't matter where the fracture is, the styloid versus the uh, base versus the tip, displacement, no displacement. Uh, Dr. Elias really nicely summarized, it's really the DREJ we talk about, is the DREJ stable or not? Uh, again, this is a, a great, you know, commend the authors for really having a consecutive patient series of disarrays fractures that the ulnar styloid fractures were always left untreated. So fairly high number, 52%, half were involved in the tip and base, and really it doesn't matter where they are. Non-unions are pretty common, but majority of patients actually did really well in this series. So why do they do well? So if you have a base fracture, in theory, your TFCC is evolved off. You have a TFCC injury, uh, potentially the dorsal and palmar ligaments, but really nice biomechanical studies that were done by uh, Palmer and the group in Syracuse, New York, showing that even if you completely transect the dorsal and palmar radial ulnar ligaments, as long as your DOB is intact, patients actually have fairly uh, stable DRUJ. So what you're trying to really achieve is retention of DOB. So I think in Dr. Ilias's series with his uh, colleagues, probably had a really nice reduction of distal radius. So uh, we really recognize it more and more that that chronomal alignment, if you don't restore the chronome alignment of the distal radius fracture. So what you may think is a TFCC injury or DOJ instability is actually once you retention the distal radius and restore the overall translation of the distal radius, they actually do quite well. So I think really critically look at this before looking at treating the TFCC on our styloid, making sure you really get a nice sigmoid notch view of the distal radius intraoperatively make sure that's retention adequately. There are cases where it is still grossly unstable. I think majority of patients in the series bore out by Dr. Ilias, also a recent paper uh, with the uh, first author, uh, Barger, where they looked at a large number of patients with a DREJ that's still dislocated or unstable post-op or intraoperatively. They actually put the wrist in a position of stability. For the most part, it's stable in supination with a dorsal subluxation, you can actually cast them for four weeks and still treat the ulnar styloid fracture and the DRJ instability non-operatively. For me, the only times I will potentially do surgery, it has to be completely unstable in pronation and supination. It's a large fragment, you could fix it directly with a screw or tension band wiring. A small fragment, you're probably looking at open TFCC repair. There are cases where it's irreducible, very, very rare. But in these cases, you probably worry about some type of incarceration of the ECU or EDM tendon or potentially the TFCC fibers. Should these, so if you do do repair, this is a great discussion plan for Dr. Ilias, Dr. Giazzi, uh, Dr. Ebler, and Dr. Chin as well. Is if you do have to do repair, should this be done arthroscopically or open? Arthroscopically, you're basically tying down the TFCC down to the joint capsule. We're also, this is a really nice study uh, out of the Mayo Clinic showing that reoperation is actually not uncommon, whether it's arthroscopic or open. The question becomes, are we doing an ad inadequate repair or reconstruction of the DREJ? So oftentimes we talk about superficial and deep fibers. So oftentimes we do repair, whether it's open or arthroscopic, we're only addressing the superficial fibers, not the more important uh, critical deep fibers. We really like this concept by Andrea Z and also Lucchetti, the tip of the iceberg. So arthroscopic, we do repair, we're really addressing more the hammock portion with the superficial fibers, with the deep fibers that go into the fovea those are the ones that we really want to try and stabilize uh, if you're doing some type of, any type of surgery. In histologic, you kind of really see those fibers diving deep into the ulnar fovea. So if you do do repair, I would love to ask the panel is if you are looking at a repairer, do you feel like you have to do a big open repair of the entire complex and dive it into the fovea or can you do repair arthroscopically? Taking a summary, I think the studies have really shown that you really can do benign neglect. I think unless you have gross instability of DREJ, uh, for me, intraoperatively, I think if you just do a DREJ bilateral, it's really hard to tell, is it loose? Is it loose on the other side? Compared to the contralateral side, really nice test described by Jupiter. You compress the distal radius to distal ulna. As you compress it and you rotate the wrist through pronation and supination, you're really looking for a clunk of the ulnar head and really looking for that to sublux dorsally. 
uh, determine if it's a gross instability or not. I think even with gross instability, oftentimes it is stable in supination. In those cases, actually leave it alone and put an alarm cast in supination for four weeks. If you do have gross instability, you really want to think about really making sure you address the fovea insertion of the TFCC. With that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Eberlin. Thank you very much. That was an excellent uh, presentation and uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes or so for discussion. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Asif, um, it, you know, you mentioned that you don't have a great way to assess in intraoperative stability, but when your residents and fellows and trainees ask you, how should I do it? What do you tell them and how do you, how do you show them how to do it? Yeah, and the two comments. One, so yes, yeah, so the Balotman, uh, where I can do it on myself, but basically I, I, I pinch both the radius and the ulna at the level of the DRUJ, and I shift the ulna, stabilize the radius and shift the ulna relative to the radius and see the, see the amount of laxity. The joint is lax at baseline. Everyone has some baseline level of, of, of laxity in that joint, and that's why you have to compare it from side to side. Um, the, the, so that's how to answer that question, Colin. That's how it shows someone, or the Blotman test, or the piano key test, if you will, as it's known as. Uh, the, the one comment that I really want to echo that Jerry said, and I think is important, and I, don't, and I think that um, doesn't get enough credit, is probably, and again, I'm, I'm going to say probably because I, I can't say for certain, but you know, my just level five experience is that ultimately the DRG stability where we have the most control on is the reduction uh, of the fracture and restoring restoring your length, tensioning the IOM and the and the DRUJ ligaments, and um, it's common when you reduce these that the radius and ulm, the radius shaft and 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 disrace can sometimes have the radius shaft going ulnar a bit, and you've got to tension it to tension the radius distally and tension the shaft radially. Um, that's hard. And what I've been taught a trick. I'm sure many of you know this already. Mike Rivlin and others have taught me this trick is to put a lamina spreader. If, if from the, that coronal spread isn't sufficient, you can spread it with a lamina spreader. So you can be cool like a spine guy and get a lamina spreader and put that in there and spread a little bit. And that helps. But length first uh, and, then, and then that translation. Because the ones I've seen, the late DRUJ instability that I've seen is usually because of more of a malreduction, I think, that I or others may have caused that may, may lead to it. Great points. Uh, I, go ahead. Someone want to say yeah, something? So can I make a comment on this finding? Please, the please. So, so I tell the residents that it's, it's, um, it's not going to come tap you on the shoulder. It's going to come bite you in the neck in one clinic day. So you got to look for it. You got to be proactive. And there's certain preoperative parameters that are important. And I think a high energy injury, by that I mean motorcycle accidents and falls from ladders can predispose you. Clinically, if you have any dimpling on the back of the ulna, you see that skin puckered in, I think that's an indication that there's some instability. And my standard for knowing whether it's unstable or not is I look over at the med student, and if the med student says, yes, I see that, then I know it's absolutely unstable. <laughs> and to expand on this thought, by the way, because it's so clear, right? I'm not fooling myself anymore, right? To expand on this concept, by the way, for Galeazzi fractures, distal third, um, radius fractures, I stop pinning in neutral. I do an open repair of the dorsal capsule and reattach the TFCC and put them in a short arm cast and have them start rotating right off the bat. So I think there's something to be said about repairing these when you identify them. But like Dr. Uh, Elias said, we don't have good parameters uh, to identify them. For a while, we're using ultrasound preoperatively, just checking with ultrasound as a, as a normative way of, of determining that. But a lot of challenges in this field that I'm sure uh, Someone will, will, will address them as we move forward. So I just want to bring up a question from the chat. Somebody was asking whether age would affect your management of DRUJ instability intraoperatively. And I personally have a question. I was wondering how many, how often would you guys do the 262K wires that you go from uh, radius to ulna across four cortices for DRUJ instability? So because Jerry, in your presentation, you talked mostly about repairing the TFCC directly. And I was wondering how often would you guys put the pins across the four cortices? That was exactly going to be my question. So I'd love to hear what they say. I never do it. I, I don't, so, I, yeah. No, I'll go uh, By the way, a short arm cast up to there prevents rotation. There's a good study talking about a long short arm cast versus, so what I do is that's I call controlled range of motion. They go in a short arm cast and they can rotate uh, within some arc of motion so they don't get stiff. And at six weeks, we just take them out and have them go at it. But I, I stopped pinning about 12 years ago. 
Yeah, I don't. I haven't pinned. I can't think. Last time I pinned the DRUJ. Uh, if I feel like it's truly unstable, I'll do a repair of the evolved tissue. Um, I, it's a repair issue, a repair strategy for me. Um, if it's a big enough piece, um, I'll put fixation in it. But my bias is to do suture repair. I'll do like a figure of eight lasso repair of the styloid. Um, you know, the hardware doesn't do great in that area anyways. It gets irritating. It's hard to get fixation. You're close to DRUJ. It's a small piece, you know, so I'll go into the fracture site. I'll debride. Make sure there's some, sometimes there's some evolved soft tissue. Make sure there's no evolved soft tissue in, interposed bone on bone and do like a suture lasso repair. Or you could do a suture anchor in the footprint and tie it down as well. But I wouldn't pin the joint. Um, you know, it's it's not wrong to. I, I I just wouldn't. I don't think that's the ultimately the way to manage it if it's truly unstable. And again, I think as one thing we're one big takeaway is that I think it still comes down to a intraoperative clinical decision judgment whether it's unstable or not. Yeah, I mean, so, I agree uh, with the other authors. I think pinning is pretty uncommon other for a chronic injury. When I do have to do a kind of a chronic TFCs repair during your recon, I will do it. But otherwise, yeah, if you get a solid repair, it's always nice. With big fragment, kind of like Asif said, I would try to do a direct fixation if I can. Yeah, to Dr. Huang's question during his presentation, I wanted to ask Asif and Alidad about um, open versus arthroscopic TFCC repair. Asif, I'm assuming by your comments that you primarily do this open? Well, so if, again, so acute or primary, I mean, acute or secondary. So if it's acute instability, fix the wrist fracture, open repair of the yeah. of that styloid of all skills, get a big bite of it and just tag it all down. Chronic instability of the DRUJ, that's a different player. I, you know, I, you know, we have this discussion in my center all the time. I'm not really a believer in the TFCC. I just, I don't get that structure. I don't know how it can be evolved in all of these cases, and we know it's evolved because there, there's, you know, we know it is, and it's okay. But once in a while, there's some poor sap who's dying from a TFCC tear. I just don't get it. So to me, um, I'm not saying others who are put, fixing the phobia are wrong. I get the anatomic argument for it. I'm a less is more person with the TFCC, and you can readily disagree with me. So if I'm doing anything with the TFCC, if it's just hurting them, I'll debris, or if there's a big flap or tear, I'll repair. I don't mind repairing these, but I'll repair them soft tissue with the scope. Um, I don't do the, the foveal um, recess and coming out through the proximal ulna or anything. I like to do open repairs if it's gonna be arthroscopic to the bone, but open repairs. I also put an anchor in the radius and do a little bit of that side-to-side -side tension, tensioning that uh, Asif was repairing, referring to. Um, through a dorsal approach. And then the trick is when you tighten them, don't tighten them in supination or pronation. You got to really tighten that suture in a neutral position. Otherwise, you, you over tighten and they can't, um, they can't get their rotation. Um, arthroscopically, you have to go to bone. And if you're a good arthroscopist, you can go to bone. Great, but I'm not. So I just do open repairs. All right, um, we are approaching on 9 p.m. It's been an excellent hour. Uh, Harvey, is there any other questions you'd like to ask? Um, no, I think this has been excellent. I do want to share a few slides though, like we have from previously, uh, and just make a few concluding points. You know, thank you all for your participation. Please follow AHS on social media and consider applying for membership in AHS and candidate membership for trainees is free. And uh, please uh, follow AHS on social media and finally, please consider attending the AHS annual meeting coming out in January. It's in Carlsbad, California. And I've, I, 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 I had these slides for the last meeting as well, but this is a hand journal club. So I guess, you know, it's appropriate we should have these slides. But I, I you know, hey, I, I really enjoyed this. Yes. Harvey? Yeah. This is uh, Mike Neumeister. If I could say one thing, I want to thank everyone to, who participated on this. This is a highlight of our journal as well. And... Uh, to see the quality of the articles that people are submitting and the type of research they're doing is, is phenomenal. So truly appreciate um, the submissions to the journal and um, we look forward to more publications like this and more webinars. Thanks so much for putting this together. Thank you so much for your comments, Mike. Yeah, that's great. And I would like to echo what Harvey said about the uh, Hand Association social media. Uh, please uh, follow the association and engage uh, with the group. And um, we will hope to see everyone back in a couple of months for another webinar and really appreciate everyone's time this evening. So thanks a lot for joining. And thanks a lot to our excellent panelists, Dr. Elias, Dr. Gassi, uh, Dr. Huang. We really appreciate it.
Yes, I'm going to give a hand to our, our panelists. That was really an excellent discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Have a great night. See you guys in California soon. Yes, thank you all. Good thank you. Great discussion. Thank you. Great. Good night, everybody. Stay. Be careful. Talk soon. <laughs>